looking for Mike as he's out this morning. Wonderful uh, thought, the depth of God's love for us. And I think it's an important thought that we need to spend some time considering. When uh, I met Sherilyn, uh, her best friend's brother was a hardcore atheist and very violent atheist. Uh, hated God, hated the concept of God. And if you pointed out how can you hate somebody who doesn't exist, boy, that made him mad. I mean, he was <laughs> just furious. One of the big arguments that people have about God, or at least the biblical concept of God, is the problem of evil, the problem of suffering. And the question is, if God is so good, and if God is all-powerful, how could he allow all the evil things to happen that happen? Where is God's love in things like the Holocaust? Where is God's love in the brokenness that we see in our lives, in our families, in our nation, in our world? If God is love, where is it? I think it's a good question to ask. I think it's a question that the world is asking. And this morning I want us to look at the answer. If you'll turn with me to John chapter 3. Uh, this morning we're going to continue our study through the Gospel of John, taking some selected passages to prepare ourselves for Resurrection Sunday coming up in a few weeks, preparing ourselves as we look at the person and work of Jesus to remind ourselves of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, so that on Resurrection Day we are ready to worship a risen Savior. And this morning, as we continue to look at what we can find when we turn to Jesus, what we will first see is that we can find the love of God in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love, and that you have been willing to love us and to love the Father, to be obedient to the point of death on a cross. We praise you. For you have overcome sin in the grave. We praise you for your victory is our victory. And I pray, our Lord, that this time of singing has been pleasing in your sight. And I ask that as we turn to your word that you will bless us with the words of life by speaking to us. That you will remove the weakness of this preacher so that your spirit may proclaim forth the powerful words of life that can change us. Give us ears that are open and ready to hear your voice. Give us eyes that are open and ready to see the truth of your word. And give us hearts that are open and ready to believe. That we might find healing and life in you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. John chapter 3 is where we're going to be today discussing a very familiar verse uh, that a lot of us memorized as children. Uh, a lot of people not even in the church are familiar with the verse, John 3.16. As we dive into this, we need to understand we're diving into the middle of the story. And so just to give us a little background before we get to the text, Jesus, as he's beginning his ministry, has a night visit from a Pharisee. And Nicodemus who comes to him and is basically engaging Jesus in a conversation that Jesus makes a conversation about life, about what we call salvation. And Jesus makes the point that there has to be a spiritual change that takes place if you're going to be saved, if you're going to inherit eternal life, you must be born again. A spiritual rebirth. And Nicodemus has a hard time understanding the concept between physical, spiritual, how it all works together. But Jesus basically tells him that when the Son of Man is lifted up, that when people look to him, that they will receive eternal life. That it's through him that they will receive entrance into the kingdom of God. This, this, this new birth, this transition from sinner who is lost to saint who is saved by the grace of God. So he's having this conversation with Nicodemus about the concept of salvation, about the concept of how to be saved. And within that context, we come to John 3.16, if you read with me, it says, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So Jesus is talking about salvation, talking about how to inherit eternal life. He moves into the love of God. He says, God has loved the world in such a way that he has sent the world the only means of salvation. Now this is very significant for the Gospel of John, because in the Gospel of John, when we read that word world, usually, and we saw this last week, usually it has a very specific meaning. It's not just the concept of the earth, but it's the concept of the unbelieving masses. In fact, in, in, God's, in John's Gospel, whenever you become a Christian, you come to Christ, you are taken out of the world. You no longer belong to the world. You are not of this world, because Christ is not of this world, and you now belong to Christ. So the world is the unbelieving masses that surround us. So when Jesus says, God so loved the world, he's not saying, God so loved the prim and proper perfect people. He's not saying, God so loved the put together ones who are useful to him, who are pleasing to him. He says, God so loved the world, the very world that rejected God and said, we hate you, we want nothing to do with you. He's saying, God so loved the world, the world that has for thousands of years worshipped the creation rather than, than the creator. God so loved the world, this very world, that has only responded to God's love with hate. That's the world that he's talking about here. So when we talk about the concept of God's love and the, the depths of God's love, we need to understand that God's love is not just relegated to those who are pleasing in God's sight. When, God, when Jesus says, love your enemies, he is telling you to do what God has done. Because when God sent Jesus into the world, he sent Jesus to save his own enemies from the death they deserve. The love of God is seen in the fact that he comes to save his own enemies. But notice also, not just who he's coming to save, but who God sends to do it. His only begotten son. That word begotten, it means one of its kind. The only one in its class. This is very significant for us as far as the concept of a savior. Because what John is basically saying here, as he quotes Jesus, is that God has sent the only one of its kind to the world. There's no other Messiah, there's no other Jesus figure, there's no other Savior that God has to send because there's only one, and that one and only Jesus is the one God sent. His only begotten Son, the one, only one of His kind, He has sent into the world so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. So, in other words, He's saying God has sent Jesus with the purpose of saving people from death. God has sent Jesus with the purpose of giving people life. But I want you to note that it's to those who believe. Yes, God loves the world, his enemies, God loves the, the unbelieving masses, but the love of God is only experienced in Jesus Christ, and the experience of Jesus Christ and that love and life that's found in him is only experienced through faith. In other words, it's not that God's love is unjust. It's not that God's love is not willing to judge, not willing to punish, not willing to keep his promises that sin brings death. It's that God's love is willing to bring death to his only son so that those who believe in Jesus and trust in Jesus have that death applied to them. Jesus came not to teach a good lesson and not to give a good example. He came to solve the problem of evil and pain and suffering and death. He came to solve that by taking that upon himself, saying this is the love of God, that God so loved you that he's not giving you what you deserve, but he's giving me what you deserve. And if you trust in me, then you get life. 
It says, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. This is absolutely amazing because God stands as the judge. James says there's one lawgiver and one judge, and that's, that's God. So God certainly could send his Son into the world to judge. In fact, God, in the Old Testament, he promises to send people who are going to judge. He promises to send his judgment upon the unbelieving nations and upon Israel. So God's not afraid to send judgment, but God also promises to send a Savior, one who will redeem, one who will grant life. And so Jesus says, God did not send me into the world in this moment to judge the world. Part of the reason why is because the world already stands judged. We say, where is God in all of the disasters that happen? Where is the love of God? How could he let these things happen? And we fail to realize that all of these things happen because of us. That all of these things happen because in Eden, mankind rebelled against God and God gave them what they asked for. They wanted to cast off the shackles of God's control and authority. And he said, if you don't want my authority and control, you're under death. He made a promise. If you eat, you die. And he fulfilled his promise. God is faithful. That's why all this evil continues. Because God has given us what we deserve. But God is love. And that even though he could hand us over completely to what we deserve, he sent Jesus not to judge, for we are already judged. He sent Jesus to save because we are judged. We need salvation. People cannot come to Jesus Christ and be saved if they do not first realize they need to be saved. That's why the church does such a disservice to our world when we refuse to tell them about sin, when we refuse to tell them about the death that their sin deserves. It's why we do such an injustice to our family members when we refuse to tell them that the life they're living is a sinful life leading to death. Because how can they know to turn from their sins if they do not even see that they're in sin? We already stand judged and condemned to die, rightfully so. But Jesus says the love of God is seen and that I didn't come to bring forth this judgment. I came to rescue you from it. If you would believe. God's love is only really understood when we compare it side by side with what we truly deserve. God loves the world broken as it is. And you can say, well, why does he let all this evil stuff happen? You think it doesn't pain God or grieve God, the evil that takes place in this world? He hates sin. He hates what people are doing to his creation, both outwardly and inwardly. God despises the wickedness that we behold every day. Say, where's the love of God? The love of God was displayed 2,000 years ago when Jesus came not to judge as we deserve, but to save undeserving saints. Sinners like us. But if Jesus is the only begotten, it means we cannot experience the love of God outside of Him. We cannot experience the love of God outside of that event when Jesus hung on the cross and said, It is finished. We cannot experience the love of God outside of faith in the risen Jesus Christ. If God's love is found in Jesus, as Jesus is saying in this passage. And you cannot know God's love without Jesus. And this world cannot know love, God's love without Jesus. And the world won't know unless we tell them. When we turn to Jesus, we find the love of God. It's not just love that we find. It's freedom. 
Verse 18, Jesus continues. He says, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light. Their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God or worked out in God. For Jesus, for God, salvation comes down to faith, not works. We believe, as the scriptures say, that we are saved by faith, or by grace through faith, not by works. Meaning you don't do it. You have nothing to do with your own salvation. You have no part to play in saving your soul. You are dead in your transgressions and sins. And dead people are not very active. They can't do much. But that's who we are without Jesus. So how could we expect as a dead person to do anything to make us come alive? We need somebody on the outside doing their work to bring life into us. And that's what God has done in Christ Jesus in salvation we do not trust in what we do we trust in what jesus has already done he who believes is not judged not he who does is not judged not he who perfects himself is not judged but he who believes is not judged because judgment is only escaped through what jesus has done not through what we do But he who does not believe has been judged already. Salvation, judgment, all of it comes down to what somebody does with Jesus Christ. The, the end of your life, when you stand before God, all that's going to matter is what you have done with Jesus Christ as far as your eternal destination goes. All that will matter is whether you have believed in the Lord Jesus, surrendered your life to him in faith, or not. Jesus says, if you don't do it, if you don't believe, you're already judged. Remember, Eden, we already stand condemned. We are already dead, just awaiting the final death. That's who we are. So we don't have to put it on ourselves and say, well, I was alive and I just messed it all up. You didn't just mess it all up. You were born messed all up, dead, by nature, children of wrath. If we believe what the Bible says about us, then we also have to believe that when we reject Jesus Christ, we reject faith in Jesus Christ, we just continue in the judgment that has already been handed down through Adam. It all comes down to what you do with Jesus. But he says they, they haven't believed in the name of the only begotten Son. And he says this is the judgment. This is, this is how you know the judgment that is upon them. It says that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light. We started this morning's passage with God so loved the world. And Jesus says those who reject him already stand condemned and judged. This is their judgment that the love of God has come into the world, has pierced through the darkness. The light has come and the world that he came to save hated him. Because they love their sin more. He said their deeds were evil. And what he seems to be indicating here is not just that they love their sin more than him. But that they love their sin enough to protect their sin. Because it says that, that, that uh, everyone who does evil, that they hate the light. They do not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. In other words, when you come to Jesus, there's a certain understanding that that means surrendering the sins that you love so dearly. People don't reject Jesus because he's just intellectually false. They don't reject Jesus because, oh, that's just not the kind of lifestyle I want. They reject Jesus because they say, I like my sins and I know he wants me to give them up and I don't want to do it. 
They hate the light because the light shines upon their sins and forces them to deal with it, and the light burns away the darkness that's within their heart. The closer you get to Jesus, the more sin is removed from your life because Jesus has no fellowship with sin. God, the light, has no fellowship with darkness. And so when you love the darkness and you love the sins and your deeds are evil, you're going to hate the light because the light is the enemy of your sins. The light is the thing that comes into your life and robs you of your delight in sin. And so he says these people reject the light and they hate the light because if they come to the light, their sins are going to be exposed. He says that they hate the light, they love the darkness because their deeds were evil. They want very much to hold on. And they know Jesus means they have to let go. And so they don't come to Christ. Or maybe they've come to Christ and yet they have a time of backing away because I remember what it was like and I enjoyed what I had. And so I want to shy away from the light because I like the way this feels. This is what it means when we backslide and fall away from Jesus. It means that we love the darkness rather than the light and that we would rather for our deeds to be hidden from the light because we know that they are evil. Notice what those who practice the truth do. So it's those who practice the truth that they love the light, that they come to the light, uh, so that their deeds may be manifested or revealed as having been worked out in God. In other words, it says those who are practicing the truth, living the life they're supposed to live, they rejoice coming to Jesus. Nothing is hidden. They want the world to see God working in their life. Now, this isn't pride of saying, look at what I'm doing. I want you to see the works I have accomplished. Jesus says they come to the light so that their deeds may be shown as being something God is doing in their life. Christian, there's nothing good you can do in your own strength. If you do anything good, it's because the good, good God has done it through you and in you. And so Christians are supposed to flock to the light of Jesus and say, shine your light on my life that all might see who I am so that all might see what you have done in me. This is why we testify, Christians, why we witness and say, let me tell you what God has done to me. Not because, hey, I'm perfect, I'm great, and you should be just like me. But, hey, I'm not perfect, I'm not great, I'm just like you. But let me tell you what God has done. So they love the light. They don't want God's glory to be placed under a lampshade. They don't want God's glory to be hidden from people's sight. They want God's glory displayed in our lives for all the world to see. But those in darkness do not want it. Secrets are burdens. And yet this is what people do with their sins. Secrets are are burdens that you hold on to because you don't want it to be exposed because you know the moment it is exposed, you have to let it go. And so you hold on to the sin that you, you love so dearly and desperately. Even though it's killing you, you hold on to it and don't let it go. Don't let Jesus shine on this part of my life. Don't let God into this part of my life because if he comes in, I've got to get rid of it and I don't want that. And you hold on to it and you become a liar and a deceiver and you yourself being deceived are holding on to the very thing that's killing you, hating the very one who wants to free you. Coming to Jesus means surrender. It means you let his light shine in your life. In those areas of darkness, you let him cast them out, remove them from you. You say, well, that's slavery. I mean, I've got to surrender to him. I don't want to do that. I want to do what I want to do. I want to enjoy what I have. But what you have is killing you. 
Surrender is not slavery. Surrender is casting off the chains of slavery and experiencing freedom in Jesus Christ. Jesus says the truth will set you free. You will be free indeed. No longer enslaved to the sins that control you when you let the light of Jesus shine in to the darkest corners of your souls. The question is, Are you willing? What are you doing with Jesus? A young man that hated, hated the idea of God would become violently angry. I thought he was going to throw a punch on multiple occasions. Made us concerned he was demon-possessed with the level of hatred he showed towards God. Is now a Christian. Because when he finally stopped running and he let the light of Jesus come in, he experienced freedom and he experienced the love of God. And all the hatred and the bitterness and the sin that weighed him down was gone. Jesus doesn't come to enslave. He comes to set us free free and when you turn to Jesus in faith you find the love of God in the midst of a judged and dying world and you find freedom in the midst of a world that has been enslaved by sin and death that's what you find when you turn to Jesus so the question is what are you doing with Jesus today let's pray Lord Jesus it is So relieving to know that it is not dependent upon us to save ourselves. So relieving that we're not even looking forward to a day (laughs) that our salvation would be won, but that we can look back to an accomplished task. We praise you, Lord Jesus Christ, for what you have done on Calvary. For the death that you died in our place. And for the life that you live. To grant us hope. We Thank you Lord Jesus and praise you for your victory. That while we may have tribulation in this world. That we need not fear for you have overcome the world. You have overcome our enemies. You have overcome our sins. You have overcome the death that we deserve. And Lord Jesus, we praise you for you have overcome. And you are worthy of a people who are surrendered fully to you. Worthy of a people who lets your light shine into every corner of our souls, of our hearts, of our minds, of our lives. Worthy of a people to shine forth your radiant glory. To show the world how you have saved a sinner like me. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that you will work in our hearts to make us this kind of people. That you will work in our hearts that we would surrender our sins that we seek to hold on to. That you would work in our hearts that we would love you rather than the darkness. Lord God, may you use us to shine forth your light to the world that you so love. It's in Jesus' name I pray. As we close this morning, for one here, you may still be in the darkness. The love of God is greater than your sins. But you have to first recognize that you're a sinner, judged, condemned, rightfully so, to an everlasting hell, before you can ever come To the Savior who died to set you free from all that. And so for you maybe it's that moment of confession and recognition of your sinfulness and your need for salvation. And a surrender of your life to Jesus. In the moment when we stand and sing, I'll be down here at the front. Brother Ted will be in our back room in our prayer room. 
uh, just out those doors that, to pray with you if you need, to talk with you if you need, because if you need to come out of the darkness to experience the love of God and the freedom that Jesus has to offer, I implore you to not leave this place until you've done it. But for the rest of us, brothers, sisters, this message is not just for the unbelieving world because we cling to darkness in our own hearts even as believers. We love the light, but our love is not perfect. We're surrendered to Jesus, but only for a moment. Let Jesus' light shine into your hearts to show you those sins that you need to remove and then remove them. Let Him set you free because the things you're holding on to that you know in your heart God is convicting you of. The things that I have no idea, but God knows, and he is pressing it upon you. Change this. Do this. Be this. The things that the Holy Spirit is moving within you, O oh Christian, to do and to be. Don't push it down. Don't push it away. Don't hide. Thinking the darkness will conceal it. But let his light shine so that you are free from all of it. Because it's only then, Christian, that we truly, truly can rejoice in the love of God that He has already poured out on us. What are you doing with Jesus today? Stand with me and let's sing.